فاشرف بي لاشتغال بالعلم ولا تبغي به ما عشت يا ذا بدلا ويا له من شرف عظيم فصل في أماكن قراءة القرآن ويستحب أن تكون القراءة في مكان نظيف مختار ولهذا استحب جماعة من العلماء القراءة في المسجد لكونه جامعا للنظافة وشرف البقعة ومحصلا لفضيلة الأخرى وهي الاعتكاف فإنه ينبغي لكل جالس في المسجد أن ينوي الاعتكاف سواء كثر جلوسه أو قل بل ينبغي أول دخوله في المسجد أن ينوي الاعتكاف وهذا الأدب ينبغي أن يعتنى به ويشاع ذكره ويعرف الصغار ويعرفه الصغار والعوام فإنه مما يغفل عنه وأما القراءة في الحمام فقد اختلف السلف في كراهتها فقال أصحابنا لا تكره ونقله الإمام المجمع على جلالة أبو بكر بن المنذر في الإشراف عن عن إبراهيم النخعي ومالك وهو قول عطاء وذهب إلى كراهة كراهته جماعات من علي بن أبي طالب رضي الله عنه رواه ابن أبي رواه عنه ابن أبي داود وحكاه ابن المنذر عن جماعة من التابعين منهم أبو وائل شقيق اسمه منهم أبو وائل شقيق بن سلمة والشعبي والحسن البصري ومكحول وقبيصة بن ذؤيب وروينا أيضا عن إبراهيم النقعي وحكاه أصحابنا عن أبي حنيفة رضي الله عنهم نجمعين قال الشعبي تكره قراءة رضي الله تعالى عنهم أجمعين قال الشعبي تكره قراءة القرآن في ثلاث مواضع الحمامات والحشو والحشوش وبيت الرحى وهي تدور وعن ابي ميسرة قال لا يذكر الله تعالى إلا في مكان طيب والله أعلم وأما القراءة في الطريق فالمختار فالمختار أنها جائزة غير مكروهة إذا لم إذا لم يته إذا لم يلته صاحبها فإن التهى عنها كرهت كما كره النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم القراءة للناعس مخافة من الغلط وروى ابن أبي داود عن أبي درداء رضي الله عنه أنه كان يقرأ في الطريق وعن عمر بن عبد العزيز رحمه الله تعالى عنه أنه أذن فيها قال ابن أبي داود وحدثني أبو الربيع قال أخبرنا ابن وهب قال سألت مالكا عن الرجل يصلي من آخر الليل فيخرج إلى المسجد وقد بقي من الصورة التي كان يقرأ فيها شيء فقال ما أعلم القراءة قراءة تكون في الطريق وكره ذلك وهذا إسناد صحيح عن مالك رضي الله عنه Section, the place of the citation of the Quran. The author now is going to talk about where to read the Quran. It is recommended that the recitation take place in a clean, appropriate area. So a person reads the Quran in a very cleansed, appropriate place. Now, this is why many scholars prefer the citation in the mosque. So it's one of the best places for them, and the scholars have given the first priority is that the recitation is done inside the masjid. As it is a place that is both clean and respectable. So the masjid has two things. The reason why it takes is because it combines between it is clean and it's an honorable place in the eyes of Allah. Your house might be clean, but it may not necessarily be the most honorable place to Allah. But the masjid is. Naam. In addition to these features, the extra reward for making it itikaf, i.e. confining oneself to a masjid for the purpose of worship, is also attainable in a mosque. Third reason why it's better to do it in a mosque is that whilst you're sitting in a masjid, you get the reward of a mu'takif, a person who's doing itikaf. And itikaf means a person who is staying in one place, not moving from it. Naam. Indeed, anyone coming to sit in the mosque should intend to make it there whether he intends to stay for a long or short period of time. The fuqaha differ regarding the amount in which a person can say, I did i'tikaf for. Is the minimum a day and a night? Or is it just one prayer? 
or is it just a split second? How long can a person say I've, be, I've done ihtikaf? Scholars differ on that. As a matter of fact, he should intend to make it to Gaf as soon as he sets foot into the masjid. Mm -hmm. It is important that we give this matter its due importance by spreading this practice and making it known to all people and to our children. Sikh Rahimullah says, This manners and this etiquette is a thing that we all should know about, which is reading the Quran in the masjid. Uh, coming here, sitting in the masjid and reading the Quran. Not only should we just spread it, but we should teach our young kids. We should teach the general mass this practice. Because a lot of people are heedless about it. Yeah. For it is something that has become neglected and forgotten. Our predecessors hold different opinions, however, regarding the permissibility of reciting in bathing and washing places. Hammam is there's places where you see it's called um, Turkish Hammam. Uh, so also, the Syrians, they have it as well. And it's basically like it's a sauna. To be honest, it's hot room, steam room. It's like a steam room sauna. People go in there and they sit there and they just sit there. So, so it's called Hammam. Um, are you allowed to read Quran there while you're in there? This is what it is, are you? Our companions have stated that it is not disliked and Imam Abu Bakr ibn al mundir whose eminence is known to all, mentioned in his book, Ishraf, that this was the opinion of Ibrahim and Nakhari, Malik and, and Aqar. This statement, this reciting in the Hammam, the Salaf, they differed amongst themselves and whether it's makruh, a disliked or not. But our Ashab, mean Shafi'iyah, they said that it's not disliked. And an Imam Abu Bakr ibn al-Mudr, and, and now we praise him here now. So you can, if anybody asks you who's Abu Bakr ibn al-Mudr, you can always say, now we said about him, Al-Imam al-Mujma' ala jalalatihi. This is a tazkiyah from Nawawi to him, which is he calls him Al-Imam al-Mujma'. He's an Imam whose imamah is unanimously agreed upon. No one is differing upon it. Abu Bakr ibn al-Mundir, he has a book called Al-Ishraf. This book is published, and it is done with the tahqiq of Sheikh Mashhur. Sheikh Mashhur Hassan al-Salman, Hafizahullah Ta'ala, he done tahqiq of the kitab. And he done it very good, mashallah. So he transmitted from Ibrahim al nakhai and Malik, and it's this view of Ata. And it is the view of who? Ata. That it is what? That is not disliked. Others are of the opinion that it is disliked. And among those who This is the second view now of scholars who are of the opinion that it's disliked for a person to read the Quran whilst they're in the Surah. And among those holding this opinion is Ali ibn Abi Talib as was narrated by Ibn Abi Dawood. Ibn al mundir also reported the opinion that it is disliked from a group among the Tabi'i. So Ali ibn Abi Talib the companions disliked it, as Ibn Abi Dawood mentions. Ibn al mundir also mentions a group of Tabi'i now, not Sahabas, but Tabi'i. And from those who are uh, Tabi'i are as follows. Among them were Abu Wa'il, the brother of Ibn Salama, Al-Sha'bi, Al-Hassan al-Basri, Makhul, and Qabisa ibn Dudu'ibn. Qabisa ibn Dudu'ibn. Qabisa ibn Dudu'ibn. This is also narrated that Ibrahim and Nakhari held this opinion in contrast to his other opinion on the matter. And our companions have mentioned that Abu Hanifa held the same view. May Allah have mercy on them all. Sah. As Sharqi states that it is the slight that the Quran be recited in three places bathing places, toilets, and at the place of a grinding mill where it is being operated. So three places Sha'bi didn't like. The first one was Hammamat. The Hammam is basically steam room sauna, basically. The second one is Al-Hushushi. Hushushi is a toilet. It's a place where the person does their call of nature. The third one was Wabaytul Raha. Wabayt al Raha is basically uh, the place where it's a factory 
where basically things are being made. And this is all types of factories. Cotton is being made. Uh, but this one basically is, it's a, what's being made is back in those days they used to have camels. They would put the thing in the grinding in the middle and then it would go around in circles and grind everything. Now we have machines that do that. But all of that, they didn't like it when there was what? Whilst everything was functioning, whilst things were happening. The reason is because the voice is loud. And the Quran would be low in volume compared to that. Note, it is important to mention that at the time of Imam al Nawi, people would wash or take baths in one location and relieve themselves in another. Unlike today where bathrooms are used for both. This is particularly important as the ruling with regards to reciting the Qur'an mentioned above refers to reciting it in a bathing place and not in a place where people relieve themselves as the latter is generally prohibited and not just disliked. Uh, that person's ta'liq, is, 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 that's the editor's translation. Oh, yes. We don't, we don't want his, his understanding. Sir? Sir. Hold on. Abu Maysara states, Allah should only be mentioned in clean places and Allah knows best. No. As for reciting while on the boat, he says that لا يذكر الله تعالى Allah should not be mentioned in, except in good places. Ma'am. As for reciting while on the road, the correct opinion is that this is permissible as long as the reciter is not distracted. So here, what about while I'm driving? I'm wearing my riding beast. I'm walking to somewhere. Am I allowed to read the Quran? The author here, Rahimahullah, he says, فالمختار, The opinion that is chosen is أنها جائزة, That is permissible. غير مكروحة, And that is not disliked. But like in what? إذا لم يلتهي, يلتهي means it doesn't get distracted. يلتهي means distraction. صاحبها فإن التهى عنها, If he becomes distracted by it, كريهت, Is then disliked for him. If, however, he finds that he is distracted, then it is disliked. As the Prophet sallallahu disliked that one who is sleepy or dreary recites for fear that he may err in his recitation. That's now the issue of reciting the Quran whilst on the street if the person is distracted. This is disliked. Just like is disliked for the one who is na'is. Na'is is the one who's drowsy and he's heading to sleep and you know he's falling asleep. It's not like for him makhafat min al-gharat. He might say something bad. He might say kufr. Sah? He might say states of statements of what? He might say statements of kufr. So that individual is disliked for him to read the Quran. Well, the Prophet of the Prophet is the Hadith of Sahih Bukhari and Muslim. The Aisha radiallahu anha narrated. Ida na'asa ahadukum fi salati. If one of you in the prayer feels and he wakes up, فَلْيَرْقَدْ حَتَّى يَذْهَبْ عَنْهُ النَّوْنِ Sit down huh? until your sleep goes. فَإِنَّ أَحَدَكُمْ إِذَا صَلَّى وَهُوَ نَاعِسْ As if one of you prays whilst he's sleepy لَعَلَّهُ يَذْهَبْ يَسْتَغْفِرْ فَيَسُبَّ نَفْسَهُ He may think that he's asking for forgiveness but he may be insulting himself basically. Ibn Abi Dawood narrated that Abu, that Abu Abdullah used to recite on the road and it's also narrated that Umar ibn Abdul Aziz also committed it. So here the author, Rahimullah, is trying to show that it's anha jaiza, that it's permissible to read the Quran on the road. So he says, it is narrated from who? Ibn Abi, uh, Ibn Abi Dawood, that he used to read, Abu Darda used to read on the road whilst he was walking, his noble companion. Umar ibn Abdul Aziz also permitted it, he allowed it. Now. Ibn Abi Dawood also reported that Ibn Wahbin asked Malik regarding he who prays in the last part of the night and then walks to the masjid without having completed what he had intended to recite, i.e., whether or not it is permissible for such a person to recite what remains of his portion while walking to the masjid. He, Yani Malik, said, I haven't heard that, that it is permissible for one to recite while on the road indicating that he disliked the action. This is authentically narrated from Malik, may Allah have mercy on him. 
So now the, con the issue of reading in the path, and Imam Malik was asked, Ibn Wahb bin asked. So somebody was praying the Salah at night, and there was Surah left. There's a Surah he didn't finish off. So what he did was, he walked outside to finish off, he was walking on the road, just to finish off the Surah that was remaining for him. Uh, can he do this? And Imam Malik was asked. And then Imam Malik said, Ma al takun I don't know a recitation that should take place on the street. Meaning he was trying to say that shouldn't be done. So he didn't like it, Imam Malik. Rahimahullah. And as you know, we said, this is authentically transmitted from him. Faslun fi istiqbal al qiblati wa kayfiyat al julus li qiraat al Quran yustahab li qari li qari fi ghair al salat an yastaqbil al qibla faqad jaa fi al hadith khair al majalis ma istuqbil bihi al qibla wa yajlis mutakhshi'an bi sakina wa waqar mutriqa mutriqan ra'sahu wa yakun julusuhu wahdahu fi tahsin adabihi wa khudu'ihi وخضوعه كجلوس بين يدي معلم فهذا هو الأكمل ولو قرأ قائما أو مضج أو مضجعا أو في فراشه أو غير ذلك من الأحوال جاز وله أجر ولكن دون الأول قال الله عز وجل إن في خلق السماوات والأرض واختلاف الليل والنهار لا يات لأولي الألباب الذين يذكرون الله قياما وقعودا وعلى جنوبهم وثبت في الصحيح عن عائشة رضي الله تعالى عنها قالت كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يتكئ في حجري في حجري both ways you can say وأنا حائض فيقرأ القرآن رواه البخاري ومسلم وفي رواية يقرأ القرآن ورأسه في حجري في حجري وعن أبي موسى الأشعري رضي الله عنه قال إني أقرأ القرآن في صلاتي وأقرأ على فراشي وعن عائشة رضي الله تعالى عنها قالت إني لا أقرأ حزبي وأنا مضجعة على على السرير. And it is also narrated that the best congregations are those which face the Qibla. The author now talks about issue of when I'm reading the Quran, how should I, how should I be? Here he, spe he mentions that when reading the Quran, face the Qibla. When reading the Quran, face the Qibla and the way to sit down. How should one sit down? He says, If you're not praying, face the Qibla. Face towards the Qibla. Because the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ says, خير المجالس, the best of gatherings is مستقبل به القبلة, that which the Qibla is faced. Scholars have spoken about the authenticity of this particular hadith. Naam. So that's where you face. If you're reading the Quran, don't turn your back towards the Qibla or sideways towards the Qibla. And you tend to find that a lot in masajids. You find people having their walls back against the wall and facing away from the Qibla. It's better to face towards the Qibla. That's number one. Number two? The reciter should sit with humility, tranquility and solemnity. The person, the second thing is the way you sit down. وَيَجْلِسَ مُتَخَشِّعًا Sit with humility. بِسَكِينَةٍ وَوَقَارٍ This goes against how we are Somalis and Asians. صح? We move all day, you know, back and forth. And this, sah? you Asian brothers, I'm not gonna lie, you guys, sah? you guys are. Cause I used to go, I can say that, I can say that because I used to go to a, a Pakistani secondary school. And Abu Bakr, it's a good experience. Yeah, but the way they did it, it was like their heads would touch the floor. That's how f f close they would get to the floor. 
Am I lying? Wallahi, that's how they did it. We Somalis, we do rukur, not sujood. Sah. Uh, so, no. When you read in the Quran, you should be mutakhashya'an bi sakinatin wa waqar. Calm. And you need to be humility. Ayah. With his head bowed forward as though looking at the space in front of him. Mutriqan ra'asuh. Mutriq al is that the person is heads forward and they're reading, they're looking down. This idea of looking right, left, right, left, turning around, keep just looking both directions. Like as though you know foxes, how they are. Huh? And then this is not a good character. The person who's reading the Quran just fully focuses on the Quran and reads it. Naam. It is recommended that the mannerisms he assumes while sitting alone be similar to those he assumes while sitting in front of his teacher, as this is better. The person, he should try to be alone when reading the Quran. Don't, don't just be by yourself when reading the Quran. Make this your norms. This idea that many people have adopted, which is, we, I can't do something by myself, so I have to do it with other people. It's a bit weak. It's a bit of a weak character. That you're unable to do anything by yourself. You can't. Every single thing you have to do with people. If I don't do it with people, then I can't do anything. Sah? To the extent I had some people, they said they went, they went to read uh, books. And I said, MashaAllah, what book? Arba'in and Nawi. Hey, everybody reads a couple of pages. Keith. I mean, it's good, alhamdulillah, if you want to do that. But you can't read by yourself? 40 hadith Nawi. Just 42 hadith. Just one volume of Jam Ulum Hikam or Nawi. Yeah? You should try to learn to teach yourself to read by yourself and not always have somebody to do with you. Because what's going to happen is if other people are not there, you're not going to do anything. Nurture yourself and cultivate yourself to know that I have to do everything. There is, however, nothing wrong with him reciting while standing up or laying down on his side or on his bed. Are you allowed to read standing up? No, he says yes. Are you allowed to recite the Quran? So if sometimes in the masjid, sometimes you feel like if I sit down, my khushu' is not there, so I'm going to stand up. And he reads standing up, he's allowed to. Okay? If he sits down, is he allowed? Of course he is. Or if he lies on his side in the masjid? He's lying down, he's reading the Mus'haf. He's lying on the floor and he's reading the Mus'haf. Is he allowed to? Yes. All of those are permissible. But if you do that in an Asian masjid, lying down, reading the Quran, whew, your head would go off. So one time I remember, I went to one masjid, you know, some Asian masjid. There's a green light that comes on. Have you seen that green light? That green light means you can't pray no salah when it comes in. Even if you follow the opinion that, you know, this is only the Salat, which is the Wat al-Asbab. Well, this is a story to the green light, but I don't want to go into that. <coughs> but I remember a brother who was with, was reading the Quran for so long, mashallah, we we, we our plan was to stay in the mission for long, and he read, I, I like sitting, I can't read something lying down. But he can. So he, you know, sometimes he's reading, he, sometimes he lies on his arm like this, sometimes he does the other side. So, so this time he flipped everything. He lied on his back fully, got the Mus'haf and he's looking upwards and he's reading the Mus'haf and he's going in Allah and Barik. And he's for sure everything is there. Sometimes he's getting up. He's, he's, in, the, he's, he's in the moment, you can see. <laughs> Our uncle came walking, saw him with the Mus'haf in his hand. He came walking, wallahi. The thing is, from the corner of my eye, I can see he's walking, I don't know. So he came to him, he took the Mus'haf out of his hand. You kafir? He didn't say you're a kafir, he said, are you a kafir? The poor brother looks and says, no. How do you What are you doing? He let it out on him. So I told him, no, but brother, it's permitted. No, no, haram. Haram. But I said, it's permitted. The brother's reading the Quran, he's in the mystery. No, haram. There was no way we could explain it to him. So I asked him, do you know Nawawi? Look how it works. If I said Ibn Taymiyyah or something like that, it would be dangerous, right? Do you know Nawawi? He said, yeah, I know Nawawi. You know Nawawi? He said, yeah. 
He's not the Imam of the Masjid. The man is, mashallah, one of those uncles who's always in the Masjid, Allah Mubarak. So anyways, I said to him, is the Imam in the Masjid here? Because it got the brother very upset. And he was very like, this, how, why is he doing this to me? So I had my phone and we went into the Masjid. We went in, we called the Masjid, the Imam of the Masjid. We sat with him and I showed him, no, he's kalam here. He looked. Mm. I said, where's Shafi'i? Where Shafi'i is? Our madha permits it, hadahu. First I told him at the beginning, just to show you Allah how sad this is. I said, Allah is in the Quran, the author is going to bring this, those who remember Allah standing up, and sitting up, sitting down, and on their sides, lying down. They didn't want to take it. When I said, no, we said it. Really? <laughs> That's the sickness in the community. When I said, no, we said it, he said, where did he say it? He wanted to know. I said, bro, I said, the ayah that I used, no, we used. So, he, when he looked, he said, oh, okay, sorry, brother. The old guy says, I'm sorry, I never knew. <laughs> we Hanafis, we only Hanafis. <laughs> so, so, it's a problem. No. Or in any other posture, dear children. Now, why do we be rewarded for reading in any of these positions whose reward will not be as great as it would be if he sits in the manner described first? So the best is to sit down. Because again, no doubt, every single body use, especially if you know if you come to a masjid, this is going to cause a problem. There's no wisdom to do it, right? There isn't. And one thing, wallahi, I have to, mashallah, admire the Asian community for is the issue of respecting the religion, respecting the masjid, respecting the Quran. That is honorable. That is truly honorable. For us, like in Somali, that respect is missing. We don't have it. Have you ever gone to a Somali message where you s f stuck out your leg in the message and anyone stopped you and said, put your leg back? No one does it. They don't care. <laughs> oh. Are you with me? It's just no one, like the manners of respect like that is also weak in the Somali community. Very, very weak. Does it make sense? Like I, as I told you before, the issue of turning the mushaf with your, with your saliva, it's a bad habit that we have. Even I have it. I can't stop. I've tried everything. I forget myself. I'll probably do it after I finish the speech. It's a bad habit. When we do this, we turn it. So we do that with the mushaf. If somebody took saliva and put it on your cheek, would you allow it? Huh? Why do you do it to the Book of Allah? Sah? I remember uh, one of the mashayikh mentions that somebody done saliva and he opened the, he's turning the mushaf with his saliva. And the sheikh said, don't do this. And he said, where's the evidence to not do it? So the sheikh said, he's about to put the saliva on his cheek. He said, he moved back. He said, why are you moving back? He said, I don't want it. He said, you want it for the Book of Allah though? So, you want it for what? So that's another thing. A lot of the times people come to these masajids, they meet these uncles, and these uncles say, respect the masjid, stop spreading your leg out towards the qibla like that. Don't do this, don't do that. And you say, where's your evidence? Where's your evidence? Ya akhi. Urfan. This is not good. For you to say, where's your evidence? Everything, evidence. It's not here. This is Does that make sense? Because even if what you're doing is right, legal, if it's shara'an, permissible, but he's telling you tariqul akmal, the best of ways. Sah? He's telling you the best of forms, not to spread your legs out, even if, it's, if we say that it's permissible. If we do say it's permissible. Now. Allah says, Verily in the creation of the heavens and earth and the alternation of the night and day are indeed signs for men of understanding. Those who remember Allah, standing, sitting, and lying down on their sides, and think deeply about the creation of the heavens and the earth. It is authentically narrated that Aisha anha said that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would rest his head on my back and recite even while I was menstruating. So here this shows two things. One, it shows that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he would read, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that the Prophet would 
he would lie down, he'd put his head on my thigh, and he would recite the Quran. He would read the Quran, and I'm on my menses. This shows two things. Number one, that this, con this Jew concept that came from the Jews, which is that when the woman is on her menses, that she's boycotted and she's left. That the Prophet was very affectionate even then, even when she's on her menses. That shows the, how affectionate he was والسلام, to his wife while she was on her menses. That shows that one. Are you with me? The other thing is that the Quran and him being on her thigh, his head would be, he would be lying on her and not sitting and still be reading the Quran. He would, alayhi salatu So it shows you even at the time when the messenger was being affectionate with his wives, he was still remembering Allah. He was still, he was still remembering Allah. And the best thing that a, a couple can do with each other is to make whatever that they do with each other a religiously based matter. That they do something that has invo that involves the deen of Allah. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will increase them in what? In love and admiration. And in another narration, she is reported to have said, he recited the Quran while his head was resting on my lap. So the Prophet would rest his head on her. And you have to remember, this is a culture. This is a community. This is a people where women are giving no importance before Nabi Muhammad came. They had no value. These women were buried alive. They were killed. Their existence was hated. When the messenger came though, this is what he's doing. This is not normal in the Arab culture. Not at all. It's not known. Even look at the elderly generations that were from our parents. This, this doesn't, it's rare to find the old generation seeing your dad's head on your mom's thigh. Huh? Reading Quran or something like that. You know, they will shake each other's hands like they were, you know, like two guys, friends, like, Salaam Alaikum, I'm traveling. Pops is going, mom's going in here. So, it's, so, it's so official, yeah? Yeah? It's very, very official. It's like business trip that he's just come back from. Salaam Alaikum, everything good. I'm traveling tomorrow. Okay. Salaam Alaikum. He goes and she goes. You see? You've never come across them eating together, مثلا. You rarely see your parents eating together. You rarely see them just talking to each other about things that are funny or, you know. He's instructing her what to do. She's like, okay, I'll do it. She's, huh? That's how it's all, that's how the perception. So even after Islam came, people still don't want to implement that. They brought their cultures into it. صح? But look at him, alayhi salatu wasalam. Yeah? He, sallallahu alayhi wasalam, he came and this is what he did. He read the Quran and I was on his thigh. What did the Jews do when the woman was, was her menses? They would take her out of the house. That's what the Jews used to do. They would take her outside the house and they would put her in a tent that they built for her. Shaykh Al-Bani mentions in his kitab Adab Al-Zifaf, right? Rahimahullah Ta'ala. They would put her in that tent and she, the menses, they won't let her shower. They won't give her anything. And then when the time of the menses, when she finishes her menses, they will send to her a sheep. And they'll say to her, dry yourself with this. And they'll throw her water. And they say, because of the smell and everything that comes from her, the animal might die from it. The way they dealt with them and the way they treated them. So you have to realize, sisters and brothers, realize how Islam honored women when it came. And what Islam came with was not forced by a, a union that came together. Human rights organization was forcing Islam to do this. It did it. من قبل الله was sanctioned by Allah. The Creator who created men and the Creator who created women. He's the one who sanctioned it. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. And whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala set, 
there is nothing better than it. If people go beyond it, wallahi, they will suffer. If they go below it, they will suffer. The amount that he set is what's good for mankind. So whatever Islam gave you as a right, there's nothing better for you than that. That's what your body was made to take. Your mind was to take. And the same with, look at men, they say men and women who's stronger. Yeah? Sah? And they say men, is stronger. men are stronger physically, right? But how is it that a woman could be nine months pregnant and give birth and go through all that pain? It's something we just we'll never understand. And you nine months, she's carrying that child. That is strength. So her power is different even from the power of the man. You see, the kulluhu is things that Allah did subhanahu wa ta'ala. How he, he divides. Huh? Are you guys the ones who are going to divide Allah's rahmah? He divides it, he sanctions it. This is for you people, this is, this is what's for you. Huh? And then after that, the child comes out and she gives birth to that child. Look at the power that Allah created in her. That whole feeling goes after a year or two. She wants to have another child again. <laughs> She's forgotten. The pain has fully been taken away from her. And the idea that the pain was there and disliking it. The rahmah and there's another strength in order to want to have another child again. And then when she becomes pregnant again and she goes through the cycle, she's like, I'm, this is the last one, I promise it ain't gonna ever happen again. Sah? So, just give it a year or two again. Sah? So, the point is all of that and the power and the strength that she takes and how she breastfeeds that child. Wallah is ajeeb. The mother wakes up, the child cries, she runs, she breastfeeds this one, boof, the power and the strength. I feel like, wow, are men that strong? Has your wife ever left kids with you? Those of you who got kids and are married. Has your wife ever left two or three kids with you and told you, look after them? Oh, wow. Well, like every second on that clock, as you can hear it, like, Time does not move, basically. Time seems like it stopped the minute she walked out of the house. That's it. Then you realize, finally, it's a lot of work. It really is. So that's strength, right? Now. Abu Musa al-Ash'ari is reported to have said, I recite the Quran in my prayers and I recite it on my bed. Aisha al-Dabra'ana is also reported to have said, so these are the companions. Aisha, she, she used to read her Quran whilst on her bed. Would you call it Abu Musa al-Ash'ari would read the Quran whilst on his bed? This, now we have an ayah from the Quran, we have the Prophet's action, and we have the companions. And that's all we need to say that it's permissible for you to do this. 